Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 324, featuring the third and final installment of my interview with Stidge, with a bonus appearance by the graphics artist Mario, who also worked on the Underrail game. Uh, this will be followed up with a little mini peek, if you will, of the game Swords and Sorcery, a game I'm considering uh, reviewing for the next episode of Matt Chat, so check it out. We've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here is Mr. Stidge. Well, I got a lot of questions, uh, Stitch, about the oddity system. You know, people were asking, uh, just they're kind of curious about it in general, I guess, but also wondering if you think that people should play with that because, you know, you do have the option for the classic, yeah, you yeah. know, XP. Yeah, I think uh, the oddity is the preferred system. Uh, that's why it's by default it's, it's selected. Uh, but I left the classic one uh, mostly because... It was already in the game, like uh, far into the development, so I didn't want to take that option away uh, from uh, from people. Uh, so oddities are a sort of a system that uh, it's. Uh, I experimented with the ways that I could I could uh, reward the uh, uh, players for everything they do in the game, uh, but. Uh, but not encourage any preference in the way you deal with different things, you know. So uh, it, it's kind of hybrid between, like, uh, in System Shock you have, if you remember, you have those uh, cybernetic modules and that sort of stuff, but uh, they're more, uh, it's more simple mechanic there because you have just one, like, XP item, uh, and the game is more linear, you know, you just, you progress through it and you get those, uh, items, but here we have like uh, more types, so I can uh, put in different areas, different types of oddities, and then uh, encourage people to explore all the areas together, different kinds of oddities. So you can't grind one particular oddity in an, any area, you have to go everywhere. I thought it was a great system. I love the, it was a good opportunity for art and some fun writing. You know, I think I found a a rat ear with an earring in it or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, that, that's the first one <laughs> you yeah. find when you kill rats, yeah. yeah it's, 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 to me, that was a lot more fun than just experience points or something. You know, it's very abstract. I just yeah. a little more. It even kind of makes sense, you know, in, in the context of the game. Well, it's, it's also kind of abstract because you find items that level you up, but at least we try to, like, attach some lore to them, you know, that would tell you a bit more about uh, the game. There are even some documents that uh, tell you about uh, some characters' backgrounds and some organizations' backgrounds and that sort of stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if people start copying that <laughs> system. Uh, we'll see. It's it's kind of a copied system already, so it's not... Uh, I just combined uh, a few different uh, experience systems and I didn't I didn't actually come up with anything new. <laughs> well, there's a oddity system in an earlier game. I don't... Uh, no, no, not specific oddity system, but uh, the system we have, the oddity system is like a mix between the System Shock cybernetic module system and uh, from a game uh, you might have heard uh, Heaven and Heart. They have sort of a, like it's called uh, curious there or something like that, you know, yeah, and it's a hybrid system between those two. So I just combined two systems. I didn't. So so those concepts were there before, and if uh, no one was using them before, I don't think they will start now. <laughs> People are just too used to you know, kill XP and that sort of stuff. Well, Zed had asked if you had considered other settings uh, besides the uh, subterranean post-apocalyptic one. Uh, you mean for the future game, or...? Uh... Not, not clear here. Uh, I guess, you know, m maybe both. Well, uh, definitely, we, I think we, at some point, we'll do uh, some sort of a game in a different setting. We won't, we won't be just one setting company, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's just too early to say anything specific. We would love, love to do a fantasy setting sort of a, uh, sort of a game. Uh, just for a change, if nothing else. But for now, we are sticking with the, this setting. Uh, Evilsoft.com would ask if you have any plans to make a level editor. Uh, well, we have a level editor, <laughs> but it won't be released for the public. There are just uh, t too many technical difficulties uh, with uh, doing that. And... Um, I think we would prefer if we just kept using it and providing people <laughs> with the content ourselves, mm -hmm. at least for now. 
And then uh, Michael Selva had asked, and other people had asked as well, and they kind of already talked about this a little bit, but, you know, after this game, what's the plan? Oh, uh, it's, it's too early to, to say, because I, I don't like the... Um, telling people about the plans in advance because, you know, the internet will remember everything you say forever and will hold you to it. So when we got, uh, when we got something uh, concrete, we will uh, we'll show show people, you know. You think it'll that, be another that, seven years before we see the next? No, 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 definitely not. Definitely not. So, yeah, do you, you, you still so. got your graphics artist there? We might, uh... Yeah, sure, if you want to have a chat with him, like, a couple of minutes. Yeah, sure, why not? Uh, so you're the graphic artist on Underrail. Yeah, yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about the the graphics then and the artistic choices that you made for the game? So it's always funny I'll, when we start a new area. Uh, Stitch comes to me and says, "It should be something like this," and I'm like, "Okay," and I do my vision <laughs> and he's then uh, I didn't mean like it should look like this but never mind it's okay so it's mostly not it's never planned that much we have a vision for I don't know for, for example core city and we think about it should be a city that has more like stages and it should have a ghetto and such stuff but stuff like drop zone is just spontaneous you know as we work we add to it so it's mostly spontaneous i don't have like a big vision it should look like this what kind of method do you use do you work with pen and paper at all or is it all digital uh i use pen and paper i make a map some simple layout how I want to how how I want it to look the structure of the area uh, and then I make uh, so some assets just to fill it up walls special for that area some simple stuff and when I have some basic layout then I add little things to give the world a heart, a soul. Yeah, I appreciate that. It's the little fine details that you see that really yeah. make it come alive, I think. So uh, were you the one that designed the Rat Hound? Uh, no. no? <laughs> that was already in the game when I came. So when you came in, what stage, I mean, what percentage of the game was uh, complete? Uh, everything to Junkyard. But it it all looked a bit different then, mm -hmm. and everything after the junkyard was then with uh, with the team as a whole. So does so Stitch uh, let you propose ideas, or does he have a kind of firm yeah, reins over the? Yeah, it's it's really like that. Uh, it, it's not like uh, he comes in, he's the boss, and says, uh, "Yeah, today we do this, today we do that." It's more like, okay. The next update is in two, three months. We have this much time. What can we do in this time? So we try to work most freely, but not to go too specific in areas, not to lose too much time, because this is actually the resource that this costs the much for us. It's time, hmm. because if I make a if I put too much time in one area I cannot finish another so I want to put as much as possible in a timely manner mm -hmm. it's like you got a t-shirt there with a picture yeah. of the game on it <laughs> wow those for sale that's a sweater I guess it was part of yeah, the yeah 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 I have also a t-shirt so uh, for now you can't buy it but maybe later we will see. <laughs> For merchandise. You got to merchandise it. Huh? Yeah, like f fluffy red hound. That will be cool. Oh, and if now you you're talking. Squeeze it. <laughs> it should make that sound like in the game. <laughs> the remote control red hound. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Is there anything else that you and or uh, Stidge wanted to add to this? 
You can get mm-hmm. the game on GOG and get it on Steam. Yeah, the usual. So you can buy it on Steam and on GOG. Uh, you can also buy it on some other platforms. On nah, <laughs> buy it on. <laughs> Not anymore. Are there plans eventually to have a box copy? Is that in the works? Uh, box copy? Mm, I don't think so. No. It would be cool, but I, I don't think so. It's just too complicated to send it everywhere. I mean, the shipping cost from Serbia to United States is crazy. So half of the pay, uh, half of the game would be shipping costs so so it'd be like a dollar for this and then 25 dollars for this shipping. and ten dollars for the shipping <laughs> so yeah uh, still i'd like to have that rat hound uh, <laughs> that sounds pretty awesome uh i would just like to uh talk about uh, a bit what mario said uh, about uh, the way we uh, uh design different parts of the game different areas uh, we usually come in with uh, like uh overall design what we want to do, you know, but uh, when it comes to like to specific dialogue, specific characters, specific uh, uh, area designs and all that stuff, uh, we just leave it to whoever is uh, working on it. So like Mario d- does a lot of uh, a lot of area design and as as design uh, uh, all of that uh, on his own. He he uh, he comes up with the concepts. He you know he uh, makes the the final model and everything. And Stefan does uh, that's a right uh, that's a quest designer writer. He does uh, he does mostly all the you know specific writing or a specific uh, uh, quest design on his own. So I do, don't have that 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 much input there. I I leave them to to do what they do best, and uh, it usually. So they usually come in and like, what the hell is this? This is not yeah, like, well, so, so sometimes. Like, yeah. it. <laughs> 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 no, it is. Uh, it's never like uh, they. It's not like that they do a like, completely opposite of what I said. It's usually like, like Mario said. It's not not quite what I had in mind, but it's good. It's good. Let, let's let's roll with that. You know. <laughs> so that sounds like a fun place to work to me. Yeah, I think so. Looking to hire some more talent, or are you pretty well, uh, well staffed. Uh, well, with... we'll see. We'll see, maybe. We're not looking for uh, English professors, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, so thanks. Go, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, those, so some people would say that we need, uh, like, uh, well, what what do you call the the guy that uh, goes through uh, through the writing and uh, corrects it? Well, proof proofreader. So, yeah. Or maybe an editor. I guess I don't know what they're yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah. I think you're fine. Okay, I'll, I'll quote you on that because you're an English <laughs> professor. I'll... Hi, folks. I had a couple of minutes left on this that interview was kind of short i thought i had a longer segment so i thought i would spend the rest of the time uh, talking about this game now this is another indie rpg crpg sent in to me by charles clerk it's called swords and Sor- uh, swords and sorcery underworld definitive edition and it is available on steam for let's see how much does it cost um 15 dollars i believe this developer is based in france now, so far, it's kind of reminded me of one of the earlier Might and Magic games of the pre-6, maybe Might and Magic uh, 3 or 4, somewhere in that vein. It's got the uh, step-based movement, a grid-based movement, kind of like a Legend of Grimrock, and a fairly detailed, uh, I'm going to turn the tutorials back on here, a fairly involved interface and lots of statist- uh, statistics. You kind of hardcore guys like to min-max, that sort of thing. I think you'd find stuff to enjoy here. I'm just going with a pre-made party for now. Uh, a couple different ways to control it. Mouse wheel. It's kind of an interesting uh, idea. Of course, WASD also works. Let's see, this is all fairly standard stuff. Resting. Uh, it's got resting mechanics. Uh, poison and disease, too, apparently. Those will only get worse with rest. Uh, it's got a search. Books, quest journals, maps, bestiary. Always love those. And then uh, unlock help icon. Okay, I'll probably be using that quite often. Uh, yeah, it is French because I noticed there's an option there to play this in French as well. Uh, let's see. Green for health, red... No, uh, sorry. Yeah, green for health and red. I guess it changes color. And then blue for spell. 
Okay, and then there's also a spell component, so quite an involved, quite involved uh, engine here. Uh, let's see, nine slots, each character, so there's no party inventory here, I suppose. Uh, so you've got the weight, weight mechanics. I mean, this is very old school, right? Extra reach, pole arms. So it's also got the, uh, like the Dungeon Master game, or I guess the uh, Might Magic games. You have the range, the guys in the back can't reach the monsters in the front, and so on. <laughs> it looks like we're pretty pathetically armored here. Only have a, Everybody's only got a walking stick and a sling, so I like that. Definitely starts you off with a very little, in terms of equipment, I'm guessing we won't be finding a dragon right away. A simple walking stick and a poor weapon. Replace as soon as possible. Uh, there's some more information about the stats or the skills. I mean, this is a, a pretty involved game. I can see that already. Uh, so here we are at the beginning. I'm not sure where we're... I think we're at an inn. These graphics kind of remind me of uh, the DOS era. That's places somewhere around 1990... 1990 maybe? 91? Somewhere in that area. Let's see, I guess I'm... <laughs> I guess my lockpicking skills are not high enough to get in these uh, doors. Probably a good thing. I'd probably just get my butt kicked. The lock did not budge. Okay, let's see. Yeah, okay, so we're at the inn. Your game is saved. So it looks like you got to go back to the inn to save the game. Oh! <laughs> That's pretty good uh, portrait art, I would say. This guy wouldn't look out of place in the Marvel or DC comic. Uh, I laugh like that sometimes. High Nest Arena. Probably don't want to go to an arena right away. Yeah, this is definitely reminding me of uh, that sort of late 80s, uh, early to mid 90s style. I'm curious to see what uh, Jay Barnes and uh, Rampant Coyote would make of this game. What do I got here? Okay, not quite sure what I can't swim. Where I'm supposed to go at this point, I guess I'm looking for some armor and some weapons. Uh, but I could tell already that this game, there's, there's plenty to keep you busy here for a while. Let's see if I can get to a little combat. There we go. That wasn't too hard. Okay, each foe has a speed attribute. Uh, fight, melee, shooting. Only archers have both options. Interesting, I do have an archer in the party. Special attacks. Uh, pressing forward, advancing, okay, move to the front, leadership, so quite a lot of stuff here, joining melee, so I guess you really have to pay attention to, to uh, placement here. I actually kind of like the way he's put this uh, tutorial together, it's showing you very clearly what all the different buttons do there. Escape, so there's turns, okay, I think that skull over there on the on the left corner turns on <laughs> auto combat. <laughs> That's kind of foreboding that it looks like a skull. I'm guessing the auto co auto fight is probably not the best option. Probably want to do this manually. Let's see our ordered list. And I want to turn that on. Okay, so it looks like my rogue is up first. Let's put her into stealth mode. Okay, now whose turn is it? I think that's my mage. Uh, looks like I can't cast an arcane bolt because it takes a rune of which I have zero. Burning hand, that sounds, if it's anything like the D&D &D spell, then I'll have to be in melee range to use it. Let's see, animal hide. That's a, a buff, I guess. Go ahead and put that on my warrior there. All right, let's see what we can do with that. Nice a character portrait on this guy. Uh, let's see. Fight. Okay, just press the F key. Looks like to do that. Press forward. Let's go ahead and try to get into range of this guy. I'm not sure how... F he says he fell back, so I guess he's trying to get within... Uh, trying to get out of melee range. Look at my cleric. She's got to have holy water. What is the deal with the holy water? Bless a unit of water. Oh, okay, so I guess I have to find water and then bless it before combat and then prep for combat that way, make holy water. Okay, what else can I do here? Shoot. Ah! 
assassinates Ranger for 11 points of damage, so that, did a, that did a, took a pretty good chunk out of his health, so that seems pretty good. Okay, what else here? You can tell I'm very new at this game, so... <laughs> if I did this for a match at... A formal match had to be a lot quicker than this. Kind of learning as I go here. Let's see, fight. My mage again. I guess I'm just using my sling. Whoa! Ranger strikes Renee and inflicts 41 damage. Holy cow, she's... She's, uh, fallen. That's not good. Well, at least, you know, at least this game is not one to baby you. I already lost a uh, character. She's dead. <laughs> uh, 39 experience. Got some leather boots. So anyway, this is a Swords and Sorcery Underworld uh, Definitive Edition. If this looks like a game you'd like me to, uh, you know, spend more time on, do a full match chat on, maybe get the developer on, whatever, uh, let me know. Otherwise, uh, go check it out. It seems uh, pretty fun so far. I'm going to spend some more time here with it. See if I can learn a little bit more about it. And I'll see you guys next time. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week. And it's up to you as to what content will be on the show in the next few episodes. I'd like to look at that Swords and Sorcery game, but let me know what you think. Or if there's another game you would like me to look at, something old, something new, something indie, something... Uh, AAA, I don't care. Just uh, let me know all of your ideas and I will consider those uh, very carefully. And as always, I want to thank you very much for your support of the show, guys. It really means everything to me. Thank you so much to everyone who has stepped up to support the show. And I want to uh, welcome a few uh, new Matt Rats. Uh, let's see, JJM, uh, Tapani or Tapani, uh, Matyas, and Nathan. And Vril, so welcome uh, to all, all the new Matt Rats who've stepped up to the plate. Thank you very much. You guys are completely awesome. And in case this wasn't obvious before, <laughs> thank you. You have my gratitude. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? Okay, quite a bit of news. Adam Dayton of Fragments of Silicon uh, wrote in. He's interviewed Rob Irving on his show. Completely awesome show. And if you don't know who Rob Irving is, you should uh, uh, go check that out. He's a veteran. Or he's a veteran of Origin, uh, the Ultima uh, publisher, 3DO, Universal Interactive, and now he's uh, working on Star Citizen. So go check that show out. There'll be a link in the notes to the podcast. Uh, also, I got this in the mail. A couple days ago. This is the Icebound Compendium. You may remember me mentioning this way back. It was a Kickstarter project. It's a, uh, it's, I guess you'd call this augmented reality project. So I haven't had a chance to uh, delve into this yet, but uh, you read the book, you download an app, and I think it, you can actually scan pages as you're reading this. It's kind of an adventure game with a, a sort of real life book involved. I thought it was a pretty cool project. I'll let you know more as I have a chance to kind of get into this and explore it, but uh, it looks really interesting. If you guys already have this, I'd love to know your thoughts on it. Uh, another item in, in the mail was this uh, <laughs> rather cool DVD. This is our movie Gameplay, the story of the video game Revolution. Uh, it's been out for a while on various streaming services, but it's finally out on DVD. You can get yours from uh, Shop PBS. I'll put a link in the show notes. Now, if you like a signed copy of this, I'm still working out the details on this, so I don't want to make this official yet, but it looks like I'll be able to buy these in bulk, sign them, and then mail them to you for probably about $10 uh, plus whatever it's going to cost to uh, ship to uh, your address. Uh, so I'll keep you in the in the loop on that. Let me know if it's something you're interested in. Uh, so re I'm really, really proud of this. I think it's an awesome uh, documentary. I think you'll enjoy this too. A lot of cool uh, 3D animation and stuff went into this. Got interviews, John Romero, uh, Nolan, uh, Noah Falstein's in here, Nolan Bushnell, just a lot of really great stuff. If you like Match Out, I think you'll want a copy of this. So. I'll keep you in the loop on that. So one final bit of news, and this was sent in by Adam as well. Uh, John Smedley, who's actually one of the people we interviewed in that gameplay documentary, he's the former head of Sony Online Entertainment. Uh, he's kind of back in the news lately. He's launched a new Kickstarter project for a 2D pixel art action RPG. I guess it's kind of a roguelike system. 
to play a single player multiplayer uh, called uh, Heroes Song. Now, so that looked pretty interesting. I went ahead and pledged to that. Uh, obviously, John is a, a proven commodity in this business, so uh, go check it out. If it's something you would like, uh, feel, you know, go ahead and pledge to that. Looks like they have a, quite a ways to go, but they're just getting started. So uh, good luck to John. And I think that will do it for the news. And what about that ale of the week? Well, I'm back this week with another uh, entry in my sort of ginger beer quest, quest to find a good ginger beer. Uh, this is one a couple of you guys recommended to me. It's the Fentiman's Botanically Brewed Ginger Beer. A fermented botanical ginger drink with herbal abstracts. Did I say abstracts? I meant extracts. Sorry. Uh, let's see. This is uh, from uh, the UK, Newcastle upon Tyne. Uh, but it's imported into Canada, and then I guess from Canada it made its way here. So ingredients, carbonated water, fermented ginger root, extracts, cane sugar. That's good. You know, I can't stand uh, when they try to sneak that uh, stevia or whatever it is, and then the sort of artificial sweeteners. You know, people claim they can't tell the difference. <laughs> I can definitely tell a difference every time. So cane sugar, good. Uh, glucose syrup. Uh, so this will be really sweet, I guess. Uh, flavors, ginger, speedwell. Speedwell. Uh, never heard of that before. Uh, juniper and yarrow, yarrow extracts. Pear juice and cream of tartar. <laughs> okay, so it sounds interesting. Apparently this is a traditional recipe. Up a pen before pouring. A pen before pouring. Okay, not sure what that's... <laughs> anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this Fentiman's ginger beer here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I'm curious how this will compare to that cock and bull I had last time. You definitely smell the ginger in this, kind of like a, kind of like Sprite, Mountain Dew. But with a little bit of a, a little bit of that ginger scent, you know. I really just, I love the, the aroma coming off of this, so uh, let's give it a taste. Actually, just a little bit on the bitter side. It's kind of a sweet, a little bit of heat uh, from the ginger. Uh, kind of lemony, lime type of citrus flavors here. It's got kind of got an interesting aftertaste. I guess that's where some of those unusual herbs are kicking in there. Can't quite identify some of the flavors, uh, but, but quite tasty. Let me try it again. Yeah, it's, 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 it's pretty good. You get kind of a... Uh, it's kind of a little bit of a, kind of, what does that taste? It's almost like a kind of a bitter Sprite, if you will, kind of like they got some lemon rind in there, some kind of citrus uh, zest. Um, it's, it's sweet, but probably not as sweet as that cock and bull was. Uh, I, I think I would like a little bit more heat than this. It's just a little bit of heat uh, from the ginger. I'll try it one more time. Yeah, all in all, it's pretty good. It's got kind of an interesting aftertaste here, almost uh, almost like a sort of medicinal flavors to this. I guess that's, uh, <laughs> oh, there's a little bit of heat coming now. Uh, so kind of a delayed heat in the throat after you drink this for a while. Uh, I don't really know how to rate this. I guess I'm going to go uh, four out of five drinking horns on this again. It's, it's pretty good. I like to think there's probably still a better ginger beer out there somewhere. Uh, but this, I think, hits the spot if you're looking for some ginger flavors and kind of a citrusy soda-like uh, 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 mix. So, a four out of five drinking horns for the Fentiman's Ginger Beer. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was thinking about the uh, uh, Stygian Studios and these guys. They seem like really good friends to me. <laughs> At least they seem to get along well. And I was uh, thinking thoughts like that, looking for an appropriate quote. And I found one from uh, Walt Whitman, which I thought was uh, really spot on. It goes something like this. I have learned that to be with those I like is enough. See you guys next week.
You made me change your mind, George. Last night, Darth Vader came down from Planet Vulcan and told me that if I didn't take Lorraine out, that he'd melt my brain. Yeah, well, uh, let's let's just keep this brain-melting stuff to ourselves, okay?